Okay, so we'll be doing a solution for 1985 Q2. <laughs> Two 10 kilogram boxes are connected by a massless string that passes over a massless friction pulley as shown above. The boxes are at rest, key ID I bet, with one on the right hanging vertically and the one on the left two meters from the bottom of the inclined plane makes an angle of 60 degrees, yada, yada, yada. They give us a couple of coefficients of um, static and co uh, kinetic co um, friction. And then they tell us uh, to use some rounded values. And again, that's, this using 10 meters per second squared as G is pretty standard on AP tests because um, they, they try to make most of the calculations doable in your head, believe it or not, um, in AP. So they will, they will let you go to 10. Um, don't have to, but they'd let you. Okay, so the first things first is what's the tension in the string. So the way we want to understand this system is to understand what's happening here. Um, so let's just take a look at some just some general ideas and forces. Uh, so let's go a little darker. So this thing right here is trying to bring it down. Oh, by the way, I'm going to call this box 1 and this box 2. Um, I'm calling box 1 uh, the one on the right. So this one is pulling it down with a force of M1G. And that's being opposed, of course, uh, by M2G sine theta. That is the parallel force down the ramp. I'm not going to derive that at this point. Um, but also, there is some static frictional force opposing sliding up the ramp. So this we'll, we'll call this uh, the... I'm running out of space right there. So F, F sub S. I'll, it's, that's basically mu sub S mg cos theta. Um, so those are the forces. There's obviously other forces going in different directions, but these are the only forces that align with the motion. Um, uh, so in this case, we got to be careful with these machines um, that even though it looks like we have some funky um, perspectives or, or directional things, you know, with you know, we have motion that looks like this, it's really straight line motion. Um, so our reference frame will go, will be basically be bent like this, and we'll, we'll eventually cause this positive, we'll call this negative, or you could call this positive and call this negative, it doesn't matter, but are we have one direction motion, it's just the, the reference frame is bent like that. So, um, yeah, we're not going to overcomplicate this problem by assuming we have like some weird angles and things like that. So what is the tension in the string? So let's um, think about this logically for a moment that the tension in the string, first things first, is it's, it's got to be equal all the way through. Uh, if it wasn't equal, you would have one object maybe accelerating downward um, at a different rate that this object is accelerating, is accelerating upward. Now, you just can't have that. It's not like the rope will bunch up or anything like that. So the first thing you got to understand is that tension is going to be uniform, constant throughout the string. The next thing we want to think about is what's really happening here. That so let's just, since the tension is uniform, let's just focus on this little section right here that I'm highlighting. That this object is motionless. So this tension force here must be equal and opposite to these downward forces right there. Um, we know that that's true because those boxes are at rest. So those two forces must cancel out. So if we think of the tension in the string, the tension has to be equal in terms of magnitude, obviously in opposite directions, but in terms of magnitude, it has to be equal to these two forces that point down the ramp. And those two forces are m2g sine theta and mu sub s m2g cos theta. So those are um, these two forces here. So now when we calculate these two things, we're going to have 10 times 10. Remember, I'm using 10 as for G. Sine theta, sine 60, they tell you to approximate as 0.87. The mu sub s is 0 0.3. Cosine of 60, they tell you to approximate as 0.5. So again, the, the, the purpose of these approximations is a, I'm not even using a calculator, and you shouldn't need one. Uh, this is going to be 87 plus, here we're going to have 100 times, so 50, what's 0.3 times 15? So 15, 
And all told, all together, that looks like it's going to be 102 newtons of tension. Okay, so that's how we would do the first one. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm allergic to easy physics problems. On the diagram below, label and draw all the forces acting on the box. Okay, so let's, hey, let's go pink. So let's start with uh, F sub G. Now we're going to have the normal force, F sub N. We have the downward force down the ramp. This is going to be the F parallel. We have the tension pulling this box up. And we have the force of static friction going down like that. And that's on the surface right here, but I just didn't, it's just, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if you'd see it if I drew it there. Um, so anyways, it's, that's on the surfaces. So those are all the forces that are acting on the plane. Double checking, yep, that's about it. So those are the forces. What is the magnitude of the frictional force acting on the box on the plane? Well, if we just go back up to here, take a look at this. Um, so if tension was equal to the force parallel plus, plus the static frictional force, that means that the static frictional force must have been equal to uh, tension minus the parallel force. And now that I think about it, um, that's a dumb way to do it because we already have the formula for the static frictional force. The static frictional force is mu sub s m2g cos theta. Um, so I was testing you, um, and thank you for all the hands that were immediately raised and looking at me like I'm a, I'm a moron, because, yeah, we could do it this way if we want to, but why would you want to? Um, so, yes, um, I was testing you, and you all passed the test. So the magnitude of the frictional force. This is going to be 0 0.3 times 10 times 10 times cosine of 60, which they tell us to approximate as 0.5, and... Uh, it looks like the toughest problem for this one was part A. Part C is just a little piece of part A. So this looks like 50 times 0.3, so 15 newtons. And friction is typically a negative force. So negative 15 newtons. A string is cut. <gasps> dum, dum, dum. And the left-hand box slides down the inclined plane. What is the amount of mechanical energy that's converted to thermal energy during the slide to the bottom? Okay. Well, there's a lot of ways we could do this. Um, let's just imagine what's happening here. That as this box slides down from here to here, there is some frictional work that's going to happen. Um, so we'll, let's just start with an, just, just an idea of what's happening. We have this initial potential energy. We're going to lose some of that due to the work due to friction. And at the very bottom, it's going to have uh, kinetic energy. Whatever's left over is going to be the kinetic energy at the end. <clears throat> so just conceptually, that's what's happening here. And that all, all along here, uh, the work done by friction is going to be converted into heat. So what is that amount of work? Well... The way we could think about this is that the work due to friction is equal to the force due to friction operating across the distance or being applied across the distance. And so the force of friction, and now this is sliding friction. We've got to be a little careful about our coefficients. This is mu sub k, m2g, g, cosine theta d. And now the mu sub k is 0.15, 10, 10, 0 0.5, and the distance is wah, wah, two. Was that two centimeters or two meters? Two meters, that's what I thought. So now, again, they, they set these things up so you should be able to do it in your head. Uh, we have 100, we have 50, uh, we have 7.5 times 2 is 15. So this is going to be, it looks like 15 joules worth of kinetic energy. It's going to be converted. Now, you don't have to put a negative sign on this one because it just says the amount. So think of that as a magnitude. So you're going to have 15 joules worth of um, mechanical energy that's going to be converted into thermal energy. Okay. What is the kinetic... Oh, it looks like I already had a sneak peek that I forgot to erase. Um, so... 
uh, what's the kinetic energy of the left-hand box when it reaches the bottom? So let's just take this idea right here and bring it down. So PE equals, uh, let me rephrase that. PE minus the work done by friction will result in the final kinetic energy at the end. Uh, what is the kinetic energy? So let's just figure, well, that's going to be, it doesn't even ask the velocity, just ask for the kinetic energy. And we already figured out the work, so, okay, this is going to be, this is a piece of cake. So the potential energy is going to be M2GH minus the work done by friction, which I'm not going to resolve, but we have that right above, it's 15. And that's going to be equal to our KE. So what is M2GH? Um, well, the... Geometry here is pretty basic. That if this is 60 degrees and this right here is 2, um, then what is this height? Well, that's an opposite uh, side, so this is going to be sine 60 is equal to h all over 2, 2. So 2 sine 60 has got to be your h, and they tell you to approximate sine 60 is 0.87, 87, I'm sorry, I'm being lazy right now, um, and that's equal to h, so what is that, um, 1.6, whoopsies, 1.74, <clears throat> it's, you know, 7 in the morning, so hopefully I'm doing that right in my head, so 1.74 meters is your h, okay, so 10 times 10 times 1.74, Minus 15, uh, that 15 again comes from here. We already figured out the work done by friction. That has to equal the kinetic energy left over at the end. So 100 times 1.74 is 174 minus 15 equals Ke. So it looks like 159. Yeah. Joules is the Ke. And, you know, we could figure out the velocity if we wanted to, but we don't want to because it's 7 in the morning and this is all that the question's asking for. So 159 joules of kinetic energy is left over at the end.